let's um, let's talk about some of your bases as well, because sure. I feel like you've gone on quite a journey there. I think um, the, the first things I remember seeing you with, and certainly I think you still do pick them up when you're playing old thing, uh, uh, older stuff, is uh, the Fender Deluxe series Precisions, where you've got the they're active and you've got a P and a J. That's kicker, right, yeah. Which of course you know you've gone back to a P and a J now with the Ashdown Saint, but you know on, on, on those P bases, I guess you were potentially I don't know what the tunings were, but I assume you were. There were lower tunings that required an active bass. Exactly, exactly that. We, we put a lot of drop tunings down to drop C as well, and more most of the time, I find an active bass deals with that a little bit better. Yeah. But having said that, this being a, pa a passive bass, this deals with the low tunings really well as well. You know, yeah, so yeah, we, yeah, sure. it, it depends on how you set it up, what gauge of strings you use, what the part is. You know, whether you're playing with a pick how hard you're digging in, all, all these things are really important. Well, that's, that's, that's kind of a thing with your basses, like that was, there were active PJs, and I th you know, you have a, a couple of those that you wheel out a lot, but, you know, over the last few years, we've kind of seen you make a move really to a lot of passive stuff, you know, we started seeing you use jazz basses a lot more, and they were passive when you used them, and then when we had the, the, the Squire, your Squire signature model yeah. came out, you'd gone for a 60s inspired, passive jazz bass, which I remember at the time it came out, I was kind of like, oh, doesn't he play Head active scratcher. positions? <laughs> part, part of that was um, trying to find a great tone with a passive bass, and for the signature model, trying to create something that was affordable. You know, that, that was really important to me. Yeah. There's no point in making a bass that was, that was, um, that was unaffordable for kids trying to start out. That, that was really something that was key to me, was to try and encourage people to pick up the bass and, and to create something that was really great value for money, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, but it, 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 it changes on the, the environment. So if we're playing in a, a little acoustic show or a radio session and I've got an active bass, it feels too much. Yeah, sure. It feels like it's, it's too much of a slab of a sound. And maybe we just want something that's just a little more reserved, and I find you often get that with a, with a passive bass. Um, but again, it, it's back to, we've been lucky enough to be a band now for more than 20 years, and I've made, I don't know how many records, you know, yeah. a bunch of, and, and you're always trying to do something new. Right. So sometimes, as sort of fashion does in life, and architecture, things go in cycles, things go in and out of fashion, if you like, and. Same for, for me with the tone, it's that you, you get a tone, you slowly move away from it, and 10 years later, you're right back where you started. Yeah. And it's just a sort of an evolving journey. There's, there's no sort of right or wrong. No, sure. You know, that I think that's how any player stumbles across their sound, and don't be afraid to let your sound evolve. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, we spoke, those are kind of, those I feel are the safe bases that you've played, like the ones that make sense. Mm -hmm. but you definitely had a, there's a, you've thrown in a few weird ones. There, there's, the a, there. there's a couple of weird ones. Um, I started a relationship with a, a builder in Germany called Nick Huber. Yeah, know him well. You do? Yeah, felt like makes some absolutely fantastic guitars. Beautiful, yeah. really beautiful guitars. Um, quite unique for yeah. me, so the unlike yeah. the Ashdown basses, the Fender basses, the Gibson Grabber that I've got. The, you the know, Grabber it, was another one I would have mentioned. It, unlike yeah. these Nick Cooper basses, it took me, the first one I got was a, a hollow a hollow body. The huge, like almost oversized Telecaster-esque, but right. hollow. They're so unique looking. They're, it's quite a small bass. You know, it's a really comfortable thing to play. Because I'd always been, more confident with, or more, it was more my wheelhouse to go for a big rock, right. dirty, drive, driven bass sound. I can't get that with this guitar. That no. is not what it what No, it's all so subtle it's nuance. It's a much more that. subtle, it, 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 it plays a lot better with the fingers. Mm. It's a softer tone. It's not as in your face. And it just took me a long time to figure out right. how to play it, how to set it up, how to, to attack the tone, um, it was me. I was the problem, yeah. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and it just took a little while to figure that out. Um, he very kindly made me a, a solid body as well, which... Oh, really? It, same body shape? Same so. body shape. Um, this one? I think I've only seen you with a red one. Was that's that the... right. This one is, it's like a, how would you describe it? It's a sort of tobacco, oh, no. 
a dark tobacco finish. It's really, really pretty base. Um, I thought it would be a bit more punkier, edgier right. in your face. It's also not that. Right. <laughs> it, it, it's not. It's not as throaty as a pea base. It's not like a big rock toe. It's just a big like humbucker in the middle of the body, right? That's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, it's it's a slightly thinner sound, right. but that that has its place. You know, maybe playing a little bit higher up the neck. It's really great for for verse parts or more intricate parts. And for me, it's just about trying to evolve as a player to maybe to suit the the instrument. You sure, know, sure. And then, you know, the grabber was another thing that we saw you with for kind of a short space of time. I don't feel like you had that for... I had that very specifically for, for one song. Right, I, I just really loved the tone of it. Because yeah. um, you went for a new one. It wasn't like an old grabber. It was, it was like in the early 2000s, Gibson re reissued them for like a year or something. Right. Like maybe 2014, around then. I had a couple of different ones. Right. We had a bit of a loan of one for a while with the, the slidable pickup. And I, 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 cool would that, that have been the original? Yeah, that, that would have been the original, original one. Yeah, yeah. And for me, that had a, a more dull tone. Right. Um, dum, 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 it was quite woody. Yeah, it was quite thumpy. And weighed a ton. And I it weighed a real ton. <laughs> but it was for one song, Biblical in particular, that I just felt that the tone really suited it. Um, and then we got, I think, a more modern one with, yeah, with the, the black set, one. With the, with the three pickups. pickups. And it, it just wasn't quite the same. Right. I, I, every guitar, every bass guitar, every drum is unique. You know, the two that have been made at the same time have slightly different tones. Yeah. Not always better or worse, just different. Yeah. And, and, and it's just when you have a when you have a tone in your head for a particular song, sometimes it can it can be a never-ending search, a never-ending quest trying to find that tone. Yeah. I also had a Thunderbird for a while, and I really loved that. That we, we, I played that for a song, Sounds Like Bloons, and it, it almost had a slightly muted tone. Very sound, yeah. Really 70s, dusty. Um, I almost constantly was trying to turn the tone control up, <laughs> but it, it was already up. Did you play a Rickenbacker for W3 once? I think it's, you did it for a music video. I did it for a music so video. I was never sure if you actually played that um, outside of that. No, that was just pretty for the music yeah. video. <laughs> but I always wanted one. Yeah, My dad cool. always had a Rickenbacker guitar as a kid. And I just always fancied one. Um, it wasn't quite what I would consider my tone. No. So I was always a bit unsure. And then last year I got one oh, in, in LA. Um, 1973. Oh, lovely. What finish did you go for? Uh, it's... Um, how would you describe it? Is it just maple, the, the blonde? Oh, you went for those? Yeah, yeah. They, yeah they did... Uh, what do they call it? They called it maple glow, I maple think. Maple glow. Yeah, that's... Um, now, this is a bit tricky because I'm, I'm starting to feel a bit emotional. I, I've kind of fallen out of love with the bass. Oh, really? It's so sad. It cost a lot of money. It was a dream come true to be able to buy it. I always wanted one, I saved my pennies. I, I chose really carefully. I've had it for two or three years and I'm just not really using it enough. There's I, a time and place for them. A time and a place. It, it's made it onto a record. I used yeah. it on the oh, Pink sweet. Limit on the last record. It's a great tone. I just have this strange thing, like I bought it as a working instrument. I bought it to use. Mm. I didn't buy it to put on the wall and to stare at and, and to be in awe of. And I think the fact that I'm not using it it, it's kind of making me feel like I want to move it on and get something else. And I kind of grew up in a house where my, my dad was a bit of a collector. He always played and ended up being a bit of a collector with guitars on the wall. And it was a bit sad. He had all these, what were his dream guitars, just on the wall collecting dust. And I was always like, Dad, you got to... These things have got a soul, you know, without being too emotional about it. These are... There's something about it. They don't want it. It's like an old car. Sure. If you just leave it sitting there, it just goes to ruin. Yeah. You've got to use these things. And, and I just feel slightly like having this wrecking back, and I'm so proud to own it, but I'm not using it. So I feel like I might. I might trade it in for something else. Oh, well, I mean, you know, the amount of money a vintage Rickenback goes for. Well, that's it. If anyone's on the market. Yeah. For... 
<laughs> we can maybe make a few. I'll, I'll, I'll cut you in on the deal. We'll make a few quid. But it, it's just that thought of hold on. There's so many guitars out there. There's so many beautiful bits of gear. Let, let, maybe it's time to, to move on and try something else. Yeah. So let's let's talk about the same because you've started playing playing those. So, so we have. You know, I think we, we might pick it up. Yeah, I yeah, just yeah. want to be a little bit closer to it. You know. So we bashed down. You know, teamed up with with Dan Lakin from previously from Lachlan Guitars, who yeah. you know is made some absolutely in incredible basses over the years. And it was great to get to work with him because we've been able to produce a number of instruments, you know, co-designed with him. The Saint's one of our, like, original shapes. You know, a lot of the others are kind of inspired by well, the, the basses we it, know. It's interesting you said that because I struggle with non-traditional shapes. Right. You know, I feel like you, you have your sort of I say traditional, with the traditional sort of Fender and Gibson shapes, and you've got the Rickenbackers a little bit different. And I just feel like sometimes when you, when you try to, I'm struggling to find the words here to explain this, but when you try to take a bit of a left turn and try something a bit radical, you often, you often fall on your face. It often doesn't work for me. The shape of this guitar, has a classic feel. Right, it yeah. feels like one of those classic shapes. It's familiar, yeah. but it's unique. And yeah. I, I, I just feel like, I know this sounds like the big sell, it's not. I, I just, it, I feel it really comfortable to play. Yeah, it's kind of, a, it's very much a modern come retro sort of That's it, but, but you have to want to pick it up. Yeah. You know, you, ha <laughs> you yeah. have to, it has yeah, to be attractive to you, a bass guitar for me. There has to be something about it the shape of it, it might be the colour. You know, I'm not too shallow to admit that the way something looks is important to me. And um, for, for a non-traditional shape, I, I think this is absolutely spot on. I think it's absolutely perfect. And of course you're using, it's a PJ, so you're kind yeah. of back to the, the PJ format. Do you feel, is that kind of your, prefer, could you pick what you prefer out of a, the jazz pickup format and, and PJ? I, I like to have the, the option to get different tone out of the guitar. Um, I'll probably explore that more in the studio um, when you've, you're being a little bit, a bit more of a microscope under the tone and, and you can really dial in, you can, in combination with the amp, you can really dial that tone in for a particular section of a song, not even for a particular song, but you might dial a tone in just for the verse. And, and this different combination allows me to, to get a huge scope of different sounds. Yeah. But live, traditionally, I always want to just turn everything up and right. get after it. If I turn this tone control too far, uh, how, how am I going to... So I would probably live more likely to, to adjust the amplifier or do a little bit of adjusting with some pedals to get that tone between different sounds. But just having this configuration allows me to explore quite a lot on the bass guitar itself. Yes.